Welcome back to Science 10. This is the 2.5 booklet in the CD4 uh, package, uh, the carbon cycle. Um, before we continue here, before I go get into it, if you could copy this down, that'd be great. Uh, just looking at the difference between organic carbon and inorganic carbon. So organic carbon, carbon that is bonded with hydrogen. So for example, the methane gas uh, that comes out of the, our uh, outlets here at the school uh, consists of methane, CH4. That's what a methane molecule looks like. So you can see it's a carbon attached to four hydrogen atoms. Inorganic carb, uh, carbon is carbon that is not bonded with hydrogen. So an example of that would be carbon dioxide gas. So you can see the carbon is bonded to two uh, oxygens as opposed to hydrogens. Okay. Uh, so to highlight a few things here, carbon is the key element for living things. It's found in the atmosphere and also dissolved in oceans as a part of the inorganic carbon carbon dioxide molecule. And it goes on to say each year 50 to 70 billion tons of carbon from inorganic carbon are recycled into more complex organic substances. This is done through photosynthesis. Uh, during photosynthesis, plant use, yeah, uses energy um, in terms of light to combine carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from the soil. Photosynthesis actually happens in chain reactions, but we can summarize it like this. So plants, what they do is they take carbon dioxide and water and light energy, ultraviolet radiation, and from that make oxygen and produce sugars or glucose. Some of the organic carbon is released back to the environment through cellular respiration as carbon dioxide. Once again, the process actually is longer, but we just use this to summarize it. And if we look at the reverse of that, sugar and oxygen is what mammals take in, such as our cells. And with that, we make water and carbon dioxide. So you can see it's the reverse process of photosynthesis. So cellular respiration, what we refer to as uh, breathing and consuming, these processes are reverse, or sometimes referred to as a complementary process. Complementary process. One depends upon the other. One is the reverse of the other. So we need to have both of them in order to have a, a balance. If you look at this picture at the bottom, it represents the carbon cycle. So you can see here, if we have fires, uh, volcanic action, combustion, it releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and then it circles back. Plants, a plant material, take that CO2 back in, as we saw here, and produces oxygen. Respiration, mammals uh, breathe out CO2, etc. And there's also a, a partial cycle that happens with the ocean as well, which we'll see on the next page. Because so photosynthesis and cell resp re uh, respiration are complementary uh, processes, uh, and because the carbon they used up is repeatedly cycled through the process. It is called the carbon cycle. The cycle is much more complex than just those two equations that we saw, um, but we can kind of think of it that way. It's, it's easier to think of it that way. Uh, the cycle is actually more complex. Most of the carbon that forms living organisms, such as you or me, is returned to the atmosphere or water as carbon dioxide from body waste and the dead, when the dead organisms decay. So of course when mammals die, the carbon that is in their body is released in the atmosphere. And that uh, occurs through decomposition. However, under certain conditions, the decay process could be delayed in which it's converted into rock or fossil fuels such as coal, petroleum, natural gas. The carbon is then unavailable a cycle until it is released again uh, by the processing such as uplifting and weathering. Okay, so if uh, a mammal, let's say, gets caught underground, that cycle may not quite happen as quickly. Let me just move this up here. I think, yeah, there we go. Now my highlights match a little bit better. So that carbon becomes trapped. So we'll look at reservoirs or areas in which carbon can be trapped and it delays the cycle. So first of all, inorganic carbon, such as CO2, uh, when it is not in its organic form, carbon can, be, carbon can be found in three main areas, the atmosphere, oceans, and Earth's crust. The smallest of these areas that it's found is the atmosphere. And if you look at this graph, you can see, comparatively speaking, a really small amount of carbon is actually in the atmosphere. So decimal 0.3%. 
however, atmospheric carbon dioxide is easily accessible by plants for photosynthesis. A tremendous amount, or most of it, is in oceans, believe it or not. So most of the carbon dioxide is found in oceans. However, some carbon dioxide reacts with the seawater to form uh, the carbonate ion and the bicarbonate carbonate ion. And when it combines with calcium, it's used to make shells and other hard structures for living things. So it helps uh, those things living in the ocean to have a, a hard shell with the calcium carbonate and making that by using the carbon dioxide dissolved in water. The carbon and carbonates can be recycled, but the ocean has much of it as sediments on the bottom of the ocean. As layers of sediments form, the carbonates are crushed and heated and eventually become rock. Limestone is made from discarded shells and bones of living things, and that is why by far the largest reservoir of Earth's carbon is in the rock itself, because it took that CO2 from the water, uh, converted into carbonate ion, combined it with calcium, and then made that, the rock. Uh, carbon can be trapped in rocks for millions of years until geological conditions bring it to the surface, such as volcanic activity can break down the carbon can carbonate containing rocks such as limestone and release the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere again. Acid rain falling on limestone will also call, cause that carbon dioxide to be released from the rock as well. Uh, so that's <coughs> inorganic carbon, so carbon dioxide. If we look at organic carbon, carbon that is inside living organisms such as you and me. Uh, of course, eventually all things die and that the process of decomposing returns carbon back into the atmosphere for cycling. Uh, there's one exception though, if something, some ecosystems such as bogs or you can think of swamp areas, huge quantities of carbon are in organic form and it's kind of under locked conditions and decomposition is very, very slow. So carbon atoms may be locked away in dead plant, anim plant matter, possibly animal matter, for many years. Cause occasionally these deposits are overlain with sediment and as more layers of sediment are piled up, so you can think of things being piled up, that carbon becomes trapped because the decaying plants or animals, mammals, etc., are not exposed. So here's a, a picture here. So we have a, a, a water area, a swamp, and then we have the matter underneath on the on the floor of that swamp and it's kind of trapped there so that it's not going to decompose and release the carbon back to the atmosphere and uh, so if it's trapped what could happen over time of course is oil is formed in the process similar to the formation of coal when decaying aquatic animals and plants are trapped under sediments in a low oxygen environment and of course that's how we get our fossil fuels from decaying animal and plant matter over centuries. Lastly here, if we look at the human impact on the carbon cycle, of course humans have modified the global carbon cycle by releasing carbon from organic reservoirs faster than would normally occur. And of course, we're accessing those fossil fuels. So the mining and the burning of fossil fuels that are trapped, uh, also burning forests also is releasing carbon back to the atmosphere much quickly. Humans are also increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the inorganic reservoir of the atmosphere by clearing away vegetation. So of course if we clear away plant life, uh, they're not able, the, those plants are not able to take in the carbon dioxide and convert into oxygen. So what we have here is we have carbon dioxide remaining in the atmosphere. The destruction of vegetation reduces the amount of photosynthesis and so reduces the amount of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere. Um, most carbon dioxide released in the air eventually becomes dissolved in the oceans, but the oceans can only hold so much. The amount of carbon dioxide in the earth, on the earth, in the atmosphere is rising. Because if we clear vegetation, of course, this process is not able to occur. And of course, it's going to limit the amount of oxygen being produced as well. Okay, uh, lastly here, uh, the questions I'd like you to do involving this. Uh, so in number one, in your own words, explain why photosynthesis and cellular respiration are considered to be complementary processes. I already talked about that, so hopefully you should get that. Two, explain the importance of decomposers in the carbon cycle. So we talked about that on one of the previous pages in this area. It's a key point. Uh, number three, the oceans are often described as carbon reservoirs. In what way is carbon held in the ocean? So we talked about that as well. 
Explain how the burning of fossil fuels by humans is affecting the carbon cycle. Okay, you should be able to know that answer by even looking, by not even looking back. Five, carbon cycles more quickly through some ecosystems than others. Explain why carbon is held, carbon is cycled more slowly in northern ecosystems than in the tropics. So you can kind of think about, in order to cycle carbon, we have to have both of these happening. So what is different about the northern hemisphere than, let's say, a tropical area? Okay, you should be able to easily answer that. And B, explain why carbon is cycled more rapidly in a grassland area as opposed to a swamp, which I just talked about. Uh, six, scientists have expressed concern about the burning of the rainforest to clear land for farming. A, explain how the burning of forest could change the oxygen levels in the atmosphere. Okay, I mentioned that earlier. What impact would the change in oxygen levels have on the number of living things in that area? Okay, and lastly, number eight here, so omit seven. In 1998, the federal government of Canada proposed a carbon tax on gasoline, and this is something that is c you'll continuously hear about. Some people believe such a tax would reduce the amount of carbon dioxide entering the atmosphere. So if we had our gasoline tax higher, maybe we'd use less gas, and that means less combustion and less carbon being released. So this whole question here is kind of your opinion. Would the tax reduce the amount of carbon dioxide entering the atmosphere? Give reasons for your answer. B, what businesses would be affected if we had this tax added to gasoline? Explain how they would be affected. C, who else do you think could be affected by this tax? And would it be equally and fairly to everyone? And then D, based on your analysis, who would you expect to oppose the tax? Who would you expect to support the tax? Okay, so number eight, I'm looking for your opinion there. So think about that. Think about what, could, what is happening every day of course, we're concerned about our environment. Would this help eliminate some of the carbon dioxide being released into our atmosphere? All right, so that marks the end of the, this section 2.5, the carbon cycle. See you again.